Good morning, it's Victor Curtin here. Um, I'm the Chief Optimism Officer of the Centre for Optimism. Um, and this event today, I was talking to people about it last night. I'm just so excited and so invigorated. And to have Luke Conway as uh, my co compare of this event, um, the muse of innovation in inland Australia. Um, it's absolutely fantastic. So the first thing we do uh, in Australia is we um, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land. And uh, Lou is joining us from the Anawan and Gamilaroi peoples country. Um, and I'm joining you from Wurundjeri country. Uh, and we acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land. And in the context of this event, um, people who innovated for tens of thousands of years um, in so many extraordinary ways. So first, I'd like to welcome Lou Conway. Uh, Lou is the director of the uh, U uh, University of New England Smart Region Incubator. Um, but the more you hear other people talk about Lou, um, she is a, an inspiration to thousands and thousands of people. I'd like to welcome Lynn Wood, uh, the chairman of Idea Spy, the chair of Idea Spies, um, bringing ideas of innovation uh, to the world. Uh, not just from Australia. Uh, Rob Masters, uh, the chairman of the Centre for Optimism. Um, and I'm going to allow Lou to introduce each of the other brilliant panellists. And some of you have been reading their comments already on LinkedIn and Twitter and responding. Uh, Lou, would you introduce the other panellists? Thank you, Victor. It's great to be here. And thank you so much for inviting us to, to, to kind of come together in this way, really, because even just doing it is actually, you know, uplifting us to think about what is actually, you know, the wellspring of that, you know, optimism that actually breeds innovation, especially in inland Australia. And, you know, where we sit in high country and the beautiful plains, um, you know, we are 12% of New South Wales landmass here in the New England Northwest. It's a beautiful place, but it's also had a really tough um, time in the last few years, you know, bushfires, droughts um, and, and here we are in this really tough you know health crisis at the moment so so I'd love to introduce you to the people who are absolutely driving the change and the new opportunities so not only are they building their own jobs you know in in building startups and businesses but they're actually building jobs for other people based in our region so that's such an extraordinary um, contribution really to to optimism and the future so let me introduce you firstly I'm actually going to go around my screen, so I'm sorry if this seems counterintuitive to others, but I'd love to introduce you to Sarah Burrows, who, Sarah, I might get you to, yeah. Um, Sarah is, uh, lives in Balala Station, a beautiful historic property, but she and her co-founder, Anita Taylor, are building a mobile abattoir and have a, a kind of breaking through a lot of traditional rules and um, to create a fantastic uh, opportunity for people to actually have ethical, ethically produced and um, an available meat. So Sarah will talk to us shortly about what makes her optimistic. And Sam Duncan. Sam is a co-founder of Farm Lab, who is really revolutionising how we actually think about soil. Based here in the New England, uh, has come from a fantastic uh, working background, working in the Defence Force. And I think he will share why that's really inspired him to build this startup, which is, is going to change the way we think about our earth soil. And then I'd love to introduce you to Nerida Richards. So Nerida is, uh, you know, is, a, is a scientist as well, you know, did a, a PhD in animal nutrition and has gone on to build a global startup, which is actually ensuring that people worldwide can take the best care of their horses ever. And um, Nerida is, uh, will share some amazing stories about how, what she's actually doing in the middle of a pandemic to actually build her business. So I think we'll learn lots from, from her experience. And Danielle Morton. Danielle is the founder of Zondi. And Danielle brings this amazing strength from working in the financial services sector, but, sharing her, but building a startup based on her passion for quality food and making sure it's available to people who have, um, you know, absolute health needs, but also want quality organic produce. So it's great to have you here with us, Danielle. We've, it's been so exciting to watch you having, you know, working through a number of startups and, and just growing this one with huge interest um, from across Australia. And Lee Coleman. Lee is the co-founder of Farm Simple. 
and Lee is sitting. Do you want to show us that background, Lee? I know we're all. <laughs> it's green for a change. It's, it's green. Uh, I think six months ago, driving past Lee's property and there were windstorms and it was just, the air was thick with dust and look at it now. Um, so when we often ask a farmer what makes them optimistic, they, they will, the rain tends to feature. But Lee is actually really changing the way that um, agricultural producers can actually monitor their assets and, and really be strategic about that. So it's great to have Lee here. Um, Tamsin Crowley is, um, is actually the director of the Poultry Hub based at UNE. So the Poultry CRC was a hugely successful industry collaboration with researchers and Tamsin now is taking that to the next level, working with industry. And what I love about Tamsin is that she is so embedded with solving industry challenges um, and using the strength of research to do that. So it's great to have Tamsin here. And Jack Mooney, who is actually joining us from Ontario in Canada, has actually just recent, has just come through 14 days of isolation in Canada. But Jack is actually a serial founder of um, companies and ideas. Jack is, you know, one of I've heard Jack say, you know, there's so many ideas, and so you'll. Jack will show you what he's actually doing right now in terms of changing the way we propagate plants and, and thinking about controlled environment. But also, he's actually had a history and uh, an experience in growing startups that grow food from cucumbers to eggs to many other solutions. So I'll let Jack share that. And Pete McGilchrist is another um, scientist who is totally solving challenges with industry. And what I love about working with Pete is that he brings our next generation of founders and, um, and talented industry people into actually working with industry to make those challenges real. And so working on things like waste challenges into food processing, as well as, you know, what people want to know is what is the science going to do for good meat eating quality? So we have this fantastic group of um, founders of new companies and researchers who are really driving the way industry operates and working with industry to solve problems. So that's our amazing range of um, outback innovators. Victor? And me myself. And uh, look, I'm, I've already the commentary. One of my favourite friends in, in artificial intelligence, for instance, is talking about what a super impressive group of people we've got here. And um, Jack, um, your shirt is already um, getting lots of fan mail on our <laughs> chat group, so if I can remind everyone, um, use the chat group. We're not in the opera. You're allowed to, to chat away. But the first question we always ask um, in these events is the question, what makes you optimistic? And no better person to start. Lou Conway, what makes you optimistic? Oh, thank you, Victor. Hey, well, you know, as you can see, it, it is actually working with people and collaborating and, and just thinking, how might we? I guess it's that, you know, it's that generative question about how might we change things and, and how might, what are the possibilities that we could do if we actually work well together and build community together? Because our regions really need us to, to lean in and think differently and our climate needs us to think differently. So it is the fact that we know we can <laughs> when we actually work well together. So, um, and I, I guess I would have been touched by other people's stories of optimism. You know, just what, just this event has actually shared us all talking about what is the core, you know, what is in our wellspring that makes us want to keep working hard. So yeah, you'll, you'll see how this, this is actually also adds to our sense of optimism. And, and your infectious Ooh. optimism, Lou, just <laughs> everyone catches it. Lee Coleman, can you move your, just when we are, and ask you what makes you optimistic, you've got to show people that, that scene behind you. So Lee Coleman, what makes you optimistic? If you'd, if you'd sat here and asked me that six months ago, it was a tough question with um, the, the background being brown, not uh, green. So rain, look, the farmers are a group of, group of whingers, so I'm going to, going to break the mould and say, you know, we are actually optimists underneath. Most of us prepare for the worst and, and hope for the best. And, it, and it's that belief in that hope's going to turn up is, is, is purely what our optimism is dri driven by. Um, I, I'm a sort of fourth generation or third generation farmer, fourth generation gra grazier. 
and I look at my my parents and foreparents and and they all wanted to leave their, their their patch of dirt in better condition than they had it. And and I think that's driven by an optimistic out view that we can make it better. And 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 that's probably you know, everyone I see around this room is is all in that same tenure of, of how do we leave ag and our environment and where we live in a better shape and, and make it better, make it more efficient, make it more sustainable. So that for me is what gets me out of bed, whether it's in my startup in Farm Simple or whether it's uh, in my business, in my, in my farming business. Um, they're both driven by how do you get a better go? Not every day works out that way, but uh, that's, that's, the, that's the objective. Absolutely brilliant. I think you've summed it up. I think farmers have to be optimistic. So you're often you're sowing in anticipation of rain and conditions. So now you've nailed it. Danielle, may I ask you what makes you optimistic? So for me, funnily enough, it's a book. So um, Miraculous Abundance for me was a turning point um, and understanding that I've come from the city, so I've done the tree change and speaking purely from people in the city, I feel like the farmers aren't to question it at all. I think that in the city there's a lot of damage done by the way that we live and so being told that there's actually a way to regenerate the soil and regenerate all the damage that we've done with our plastics and, and you know, in the city we're told don't do this and don't buy plastic and recycle and do this and there's just no optimism in that. It's very a don't, don't, don't society and so to finally be told all the do's do this, do this with the soil, grow your veggies at home, do this, do that. It's just amazing. And so our whole life now follows that regenerative agriculture pathway and our kids are happier, we're optimistic, we have fruit and vegetables growing on our acreage now in the country and, and everyone in the country has been so welcoming and embracing. And so it just makes me optimistic that we can actually help to heal the planet and hopefully put us on a different pathway and give our kids a future um, that is so different to what I thought was possible. Well, I'm in, in COVID lockdown in Melbourne, and, and I think if all of our leaders could get that message from you, the do, 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 rather than the don't, 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 God, we'd be living better, wouldn't we? Absolutely. <laughs> Mary Richards. Well, so well, much easier. Pardon. Go so on, much then. easier. Sorry. <laughs> Go on. So much easier to action if you've got a do message. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Merida Richards, what makes you optimistic? Well, I, I actually think I was probably born like this and we've got a little scientific study here of N equals two because Pete is my brother. <laughs> so <laughs> um, out of the same family. But, you know, my dad always said to us, you can do anything you want. Um, and I think, you know, growing up with that message, you, you tend to be pretty optimistic. We're also um, a grazing family. So there was always that, you know, the rain can't stay up there forever. It, it, it will rain uh, and I, I, I've just always had this attitude that that you know if you want to do something you probably can I remember saying to dad when I was a kid I wanted some horse stables and could I build them like I actually thought I could um, and I remember reading a quote it was when I just started my PhD it was Pablo Picasso that everything you can imagine is real and I and I stuck that in, it's actually in the acknowledgements in my PhD and, and it's still my favourite quote, you know, I really do think that if, if you want something badly enough and you work at it hard enough, then you can make stuff happen. God, I hope, I hope Pablo Picasso is decorating the front of your PhD too. The, there's so many dull <laughs> no, colours of those things. Definitely not. I don't have it. I don't have the, um, yeah, no, it's black. <laughs> Sarah Burrows, what makes you optimistic? Oh, so many things make me optimistic. Um, living in the country and the people that surround me. Uh, I, I moved home from Africa eight years ago and um, sort of my, my husband wanted to go farming. He'd never been a farmer before, but he decided that actually that's what he'd wanted to do all his life. And uh, I rapidly discovered I wasn't a great farmer's wife. But luckily, I live in the country. There's a great university in my area and they gave me a job. Um, I've never had any reason not to be optimistic. If you want to make things happen, just like Nerida said, do it. And it just happens. Life, life is great. We're lucky to, to be alive every day. It's, um, you know, watching the grass grow on my farm, um, being able to do a startup like Red 8 that that means that farmers can get a better return and animals can get a better life and death. Um, 
butchers can have a better point of differentiation, consumers can get what they want. And it's all because I'm surrounded by these very people here, these, these supported, amazing friends that I've made at the SRI and, and what they've done for me and my family and my husband. What's, how could you not be optimistic? I asked <laughs> Bill George, the global guru on leadership, what makes him optimistic? And it's exactly as you say, it's being surrounded by optimistic, positive people. We've got to drink from that well every day. Sam Duncan, what makes you optimistic? Hey, Victor. Um, yeah, I, I meditated long and hard over this question. And it's funny because we had a bit of a discussion last night around this. And I realised, I guess, what, what makes me optimistic is kind of the same thing that drives me. And I think we had Danielle and Lee sort of talk about this as well. I mean, for me, you know, at, at heart, it's, um, you know, it's, it's climate change. It's, it's solving that, that challenge. That is an existential challenge that we need to solve over the next 30 years or else we're going to be in a lot of trouble. Um, I mean, not necessarily us, but um, some other parts of the world, you know, the less developed parts of the world. But there's, there's another piece to this. It's, it's, you know, what keeps you optimistic on that journey, right, Victor? And I think you said it there, and I think Sarah just, just stole the words out of my mouth. Like, that, that is exactly it. It's the, the people that are driven and are doing similar things to you, maybe not in the same space, but that have these wild dreams that you just look, you look at and you think, wow, that's, that's awesome. I'm, you know, I, it just gives you energy. You just feed off it. And um, I think, I think there's what makes me optimistic, which is kind of that drive in life, but there's what keeps me optimistic, which is, um, which is this. So, yeah. And I, I like the fact that you're kind of pulling all those, all this, all these optimism, all, all these optimistics together to, to sort of showcase that because it's uh, it's a great source of energy. I, I love it, Victor. Well, that's what the country and the world needs in the, in the middle of what is otherwise misery. So, Tamsin, what makes you optimistic? Well, like Sam, I spent a bit of time thinking about this last night and I realised that, like many of the other panellists, I've probably been optimistic all my life, but I never realised it. And I think the point in my life when I realised it was when we were working in the lab, um, back when I worked in the lab as a scientist, and someone said to me, how do you deal with the constant disappointment of being a scientist? And I stopped and I thought, what do you mean constant disappointment? And I thought, well, everything you do, most of the results are negative. So you're constantly finding out what you thought was wrong. And I stopped and I thought, gosh, I've never thought about it like that. I've always thought that you do something and it then presents another challenge. And you know that wasn't the right way to go, but there's more opportunity. And so... I think that was the point when I realised that everything that I look at is optimistic. So for me, finding out that wasn't an answer presents an awesome opportunity to do something else. And, and so really, I think the crux of mine is, is really getting knowledge and solving problems. And in my job now, I would say my favourite part is when a farmer rings me and says, I've got this problem. Tamsin, what am I going to do? And for me to be able to use the resources I've got and not just my brain, but again, like Sarah said, the people around me and the, the network that we've got to solve those problems and to be able to ring that farm back and go, hey, what do you think about this? And, you know, it eventually does solve their problem. That's it. That just keeps me going. So, yeah. Well, it's, it's like Dyson, the vacuum cleaner man. He claim to do 5,000 iterations of the vacuum cleaner yep. or 5,001 was the instant success. Yeah. <laughs> Jack Mooney, everyone loves your shirt. Um, you're the one that's furthest away. What makes you optimistic? Oh, hopefully I'm more optimistic than the Dyson guy. 5,000 iterations, yeah. that'd really suck, wouldn't it? Uh, no, but uh, yeah, good question. We were, we were talking about it earlier with Lou and I was sort of wondering if I was really the right person to be on this because I wasn't actually sure if I was optimistic. I've always thought I was more foolish than optimistic, but I think it's better to be uh, a little bit optimistic than pessimistic and, and correct all the time. So uh, a little bit like following on what Tamsin said, I like making mistakes and, <laughs> and stuffing up all the time and then learning from it. And that's what I think optimism is, is uh, seeing exactly what it is for the way it is and then acting upon it and making it a better situation. Gareth Evans, the, the former Australian foreign minister um, in his book, said better to be an optimist and be wrong uh, some of the time than be a pessimist and be right all of the time. <laughs> you nailed it, Jack. Peter, what makes you optimistic? Yeah, thanks, Victor. Well, 
it's it's probably a combination of a lot of things. But I think um, one thing that makes me optimistic is, I guess, being a conceptualizer, I would put myself in that category, and, and where you can, I guess, see the see the path forward or see the problem you've got to solve, and and you've got all these parts parts of the problem that are all spread out, maybe all over the world or all over you know, across different institutions or whatever it is that you need to, to bring them together. So it's it's the ability in the modern day and that increasing ability as we go through time to be able to uh, connect with people all over the world and in different, in different industries much more readily, easily than we could in the past to be able to solve, you know, the problems of research that we're trying to solve, you know, for um, whatever it might be, be it eating quality or waste management or, or whatever that is. So... I think that the networks we have, um, the ability to communicate, you know, through during this pandemic, you know, business didn't stop at all. We had perfect, perfect uh, ability to touch base with everyone, and and uh, probably being a total extrovert, I'd maybe touch base with more people than than um, a lot of other people did. But uh, you know, that kept me kept me entertained while we we're in uh, shutdown. But yeah, I think uh, that's what keeps me going is the is the need the need in the world for food and the knowledge that, that uh, food is something that we all love and enjoy. And, you know, I play a big part in that in terms of the, in terms of the red meat on that plate. So um, yeah, that's what keeps me going. I love that, that brilliant effervescence. It's just, I love what you do, Peter. Lindwood, what makes you optimistic? It's seeing all the positive ideas being posted on idea spies every day and particularly the ideas that Lou is posting as our agriculture editor and introducing me to this incredible group of people. Uh, I love the, your expression, uh, Outback Innovators, Lou. It's a wonderful group of people and congrats on getting them all together. Looking forward to the discussion. Rob Masters, what makes you optimistic? I think it's the uh, people of regional or rural Australia, Victor, um, just listening to the optimism from each of the people here um, reflects exactly how optimistic race we are in Australia and, and what Lee has shown from what the harshness of the country to a beautiful background now uh, demonstrates that there's always optimism in rural, in rural Australia. Well, I'm, I'm inspired. I'm walking on air. I don't know about everyone else. But Lou, if I can hand over to you, I'll take a back seat and I'll just be the techo looking at chat and questions. Okay. Lead away, Lou Conway. Uh, look, what we thought we might do is actually um, just give you a little window into how people are thinking kind of outside of the box about their business or their, um, or their research right now. And, and just thinking about what they're doing and, and in practice and actually what they're thinking about to kind of really come through into the next next stage of growth. And I just wondered, Lee, could I could I ask you to kind of kick off that discussion? Because we talked about this last night where you actually gave us a sense of how things have changed when you came back on to, into agriculture. And so my, I think that was a great clue as to how you're really thinking outside the box. And then we'd love everybody to just jump Hello. So, so innovation and change, and, and we had a bit of a chat, talk about different sustainability earlier before we got on air. And for me, looking at ag, I remember sitting at the dining table as a kid and my dad saying, in your lifetime, boys, my brother and myself, both farmers now, he said, you know, you're going to see the globe where the world can't produce enough food to feed itself. And, and here we are, fast forward 30 years, and, and agriculture has, has got this massive ability to just keep stepping up to the plate and going, right, we, we will answer this question as to how we're going to produce quality food at a more sustainable and more economic outcome. Um, and, and that, for me, drives a lot of our desire and want, uh, and, and it's optimism. We look at that and say, the outcome we're going to get out of um, ag in the future is going to be better than what we had yesterday. Um, and and you know, nearly everyone in this group, we look around the, the, all the cohort of founders here, believe our desire and our love, our passion where we are in ag, and we want to leave it in a better situation than where we started out. Um, and, and, you know, the innovation of, of, uh, of my, my sector in, in farming, cropping 
particularly. It wouldn't survive if we didn't have Optimus sitting there going, I'm not happy with what I do today. How do I do it better? How do I make it more efficient? How do I use less water? How do I, how do I grow more crop? And, and, and that's paramount in, I think, what gets us out of bed. And so, and using your skills in tech and software engineering to kind of bring that into a really data relevant um, story as well. Lee, do you want to just talk about that? Yep. Um, so, so that my, my, yeah, my background, I, I grew up, I grew up farming with my family farm. I, I'm a mechanical engineer by trade, went away to work in the paper industry for 12 years. And that, that really showed me more of a business. And it was with uh, Visi Paper. That group was um, highly motivated on sustainability and how to, push, how to push the envelope and how to be optimistic about an outcome. And, and they really set, I'll call it set a goal of unachievable and achieved awesome results out of it. Um, coming back to farming, it was is how do we take what we do today and, and embed what we do and, and make it more efficient. And that's what led us to looking at a farm management system, which is farm simple and, and try and allow compliance or allow efficiency, allow uh, visibility for an operation so that you can leverage off the tech we've all got on our phone today and run a farming business much more uh, succinct, much more visible, much simpler um, and get on with the important part of, of how do you be prepared for the rain next week. Fantastic. Thank you, Lee. Hey, Nerida, I kind of do want to go to you because everything you imagine is real. <laughs> what, what, how are you thinking outside the box in terms of your business? And do you want to just give us a sense of FeedXL as well? Yeah, so um, I always, when I get um, pulled into agricultural groups, I always have a bit of a chuckle because here I am as a horse nutritionist taking food, taking human grain food. <laughs> and feeding it to animals that we don't eat so not contributing at all to the problem of, of feeding the world but I do think you know the horse industry um, contributes a lot to our culture um, our mental health I mean horses particularly for women you know most of our most of our customers are women and there's just something about women and horses we just speak the same language um, we've got this real connection and, and I do think I know certainly personally for me you know horses are a real sense of um, calm in the business of life and just a, they just give me joy and, the, and it's the same for so many people so I, I get a lot of personal satisfaction out of knowing that you know our business which is um, software it's like a nutrition calculator that helps people sort through the thousands of different feed ingredients and forages um, that they could feed their horse keep them healthy because you know these horses are part of people's families um, so they're it's really important to horse owners to have their horses as healthy as their children, essentially, and, and that's what that's what our um, company works towards. So, um, as far as thinking outside the box, I guess we we had uh, you know in March when when everything sort of um, went into lockdown, there was this momentary sense of <laughs> you know it just it felt like everyone was losing their job and that no one was going to have any income just momentarily, you know, like for a couple of days. Uh, and we were actually at this point about to put up our prices by a considerable amount, like 300% um, price rise, because we'd been just um, hadn't looked at that part of our business, uh, you know, big, big learning curve for us um, as far as things that you should be doing as, as entrepreneurs and, and stuff that got kind of left behind. Um, and so, you know, we're looking at potentially people having no income and then we're saying, and now we're going to charge you a lot more um, for our services. Uh, and there was, we were like, what are we, what are we going to do? Um, but we all, as a team, went, we just have to keep moving forward. We can't, we can't let our circumstances determine our actions here. Um, and so for FedExL, we've just continued on um, with the mindset that you know people still need our services and not everyone has lost their job in the world uh, and often you know it's interesting in um, 2008 with the GFC I think uh, Ali Tullor who's our other buddy in our um, leadership program was saying that spending on pets actually increased during that time and I know back then as as um, a consultant working with feed companies the feed companies I worked for were really concerned that you know there wasn't going to be money to spend on horse feed um, but it just the horse industry just kept going so 
uh, we're kind of a little bit sheltered, I think, in some ways from from the lumps and bumps of the economies around the world. So we've just now went, well, people have got more time um, because, and people genuinely have, like we've had a lot more engagement. Um, our sales are really strong. We've had the best three months we've ever had. So, <laughs> you know, that, that helps to make us very optimistic. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think just having that attitude of let's just, we know where we're going. Let's just keep going there um, and not, and not let something outside of our control stop us from from doing that. Yeah, fantastic, Merida. I'm just wondering who else would like to talk about how they're thinking outside the box. Um, so, Jack, you were keen to share. You, you're seeing some of these um, pink uh, power generating greenhouses. In, um, yeah, do you want to talk about what are you? How are you thinking outside the box as a, a grafter? You know, tell us about it. Yeah, so uh, the example that Lou's talking about is in the horticulture sector, it's often a, a massive uh, conglomerate of innovation. And one innovation that's really hitting the space at the moment is your pink coloured glass. So the problem we have, well, not the problem, but a, an issue that we do face uh, in horticulture is we need high intense glass houses to be able to grow our food efficiently and use as little water as possible. But one of the uh, problems we face with that is when we grow in these high-tech glass houses, you can't equip the roof of your building with solar panels because then no light would actually come into your plants. So there's a new innovation in the, in the horticultural space where we actually infuse solar cells into the actual glass of the building and it can actually capture that photo energy and convert it into energy that you can use to then heat or cool inside your greenhouse. Um, so, and that's, it's really what makes me optimistic. Just, we've got so many sexy toys in horticulture and that's why I just really love it. Like we've just got so many amazing innovations and advances in technology and, and just coming back to, you know, the way that we're innovating uh, amidst this pandemic. I'm currently in Ontario. I'm on day two of my new gig as a grower manager uh, for will be a 16 acre uh, propagation facility producing about 40 million seedlings into North America. And just with the, the lockdown in North America, a lot more people staying at home. And we've seen a 400 times increase in the number of e-commerce plants that we've been able to sell online. Uh, I think everybody's become a home gardener overnight. So, you know, that's just an example of a business over here that is faced with a tough situation and really just made the best out of it and has resulted in positive impact for its customers as well. So, so how does it make you think about the, um, you know, for you and yourself and what, what you will do, you know, what are you aiming for next as the, because I know you've changed the way we think about propagation success in um, plants. What's the next goal, do you think, in propagation? It makes me think we're all unstoppable, Lou. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> There's no 100%. problem. With that. So, yeah, the, the main thing that I'm sinking my teeth into now is... Uh, I'm doing my PhD in grafting, so particularly in the grafting of tomato crops. So when we do the grafting, we grow a rootstock and a scion variety. And when we fuse those two plants together, we get lots of disease resistance and significant yield benefits. But when you're cutting plants in half and getting them to join back together, sometimes the seedlings don't really like that because they don't belong to each other. So there needs to be factors and environment that's conducive to getting those plants to heal. So the thing that I'm sinking my teeth into now is really optimizing that grafting process. At the moment, we can have up to a 30% loss in that grafting process. In my former role as nursery manager at Gyra uh, for the Costa Group, we're able to get that down to 0.01%. So really, we hardly lose any seedlings. Uh, we have a turnaround that's half as quick um, as what it was before. So that's what I'm trying to bring into North America, um, trying to emulate some of the results that I've seen in Australia and spread it around the world, I guess. Fantastic, Jack. Sarah, you was in this, while we're talking food, plants and meat go quite, quite nicely together, I think. Um, and then I'll grab Danielle to talk about, yeah, what, what are you, you know, what are you working on that's really going to future-proof us as well? Well, when we came back to Australia and went farming, one of the first things that I hated was that our cattle were really happy and had never had anything go wrong in their lives. And the first time I saw a truck arrive to take them away, their temperament changed. They went from 
sort of poking along like normal to bellowing up the up the the ramp and into the trucks and I thought um this is just not great and then I went to work I worked at the university and and my then boss said I've got this idea called happy cow and uh, it's exactly the same thing she had exactly the same feelings about the same problem and so we found a better way to do it which is um taking the abattoir to the farm now this is in no way taking away from the fact that traditional abattoirs are a necessity for the world but for niche markets and for those farmers who uh, want to do it it gives them an opportunity to get a better return for their cattle and um you know there's no there's no weight loss or damage to them from transport um, they don't get completely stressed out by doing something new and going somewhere new and so they have a, a better life and a better death and therefore produce better meat for people like pete to test and um so the hard part around that has been that a lot of people have tried to do it but the regulations are really strict and they're really strict for great reasons like nobody wants to kill people with bad meat and so we have discovered ways to do that and we are building we're halfway through the build of, of our abattoir and our model is different to what's been done elsewhere in the world because it's very nimble and agile and lightweight so it can go onto any farm so there are already some of these that go to farms but they're huge they're big prime movers and um a prime mover would struggle to get to my cattle yards and all my sheep yards um and we can also maybe end up solving some problems about feral animals as well. So our goals kind of change quite regularly, but it's all the base thing of taking an abattoir on farm and matching the regulations to do so. Fantastic. At a time when people are looking for, you know, decommodified food source and local food networks, we've certainly seen that changing dramatically over the last few months. So yeah, regional food. Yeah. Sorry, I'm just going to again another thing in the pandemic i think people are um people are seeing that you have to have regional food you know like if you fly food across the world it's not actually quite as good as 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 having lower food miles and eating what grows in your own area and eating seasonal produce and high nutrition food which i'm sure danielle will back me up on it's you know knowing what you eat people care about what they eat how it was treated in its life whether it be grain or or an animal it's it's still you want it to be good food you want it to be worthwhile growing and eating now you're a chef in your uh in your background as well aren't you <laughs> well, you're speaking with knowledge of this yeah well you know, well well grown food tastes better too yeah. and um it's nice to be able to enjoy what you eat rather than only eating for the for the function of living now, Danielle, this is an area dear to your heart and you're thinking absolutely outside the box that you could give the power to the consumer to know where that food has come from. Do you want to share how you're, you're bringing something to market that's pretty extraordinary? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Lou. Um, so we're working in fruit and vegetable analysis and we have scientifically proven technology that enables consumers to actually you know, essentially take a photo with a smartphone of an apple and we can tell you if it was grown with pesticides, what type of pesticides or if it has a high nutrition value and whether it's been, you know, on the shelf or frozen for six months and so therefore lower nutrition value for the consumers. You know, traditionally it's all been about how it looks. Well, all of a sudden you're actually able to see below the skin and see below the surface and see all these things that weren't visible in the past. And so it's about education and, and consumers actually starting to take control of, of going, okay, well, what I put into my body is, is what I get out of it and understanding that, um, you know, how we grow the food and the soil actually influences the the I guess, nutrients in there so that you may not have to have supplements like magnesium to help you sleep and all of these different things if there is sufficient nutrients within the fruit and vegetables that you're eating. And so our um, technology is so exciting and groundbreaking that so many people ask me, how is it possible? And, and I'm lucky enough to work with a biosystems engineer um, in our team who just breaks the boundaries every day and we're looking at milk powders and we can actually look at provenance down to the regionality of where those cows actually ate the 
the grass, which is just so mind blowing and incredible and makes me so optimistic. And I think consumers are where we will drive change. Mm. And I think as a custodian of that, I have to be really careful and make sure that there is, you know, a, a collaboration between farmers and consumers and that together we can actually drive um, that change and know where our food comes from. Yeah. I love the way you do that with confidence of engaging with consumers and really understanding their health requirements and, yeah, and, and acting on that. So um, we've seen you do that on so many levels and connecting to people across our region in the pandemic when there was a lot of concern about food supplies, you moved in and just helped people to locate food they needed. So I think we've seen evidence of that. And Sam, I'm going to ask you, because you're thinking outside the box about this whole, there's been a lot of discussion around obviously carbon and can you, yeah, what, tell us, give us a window into your thinking of the... <coughs> yeah, okay, I've been working on the 20 second pitch. So I think, I think this is good because we, there's probably a lot, of, a lot of listeners that maybe don't have an ag background, um, live in cities and so, and that's really, you know, Danny's technology is super important because it gives them a bit of an insight into this world. Just talking more broadly, I mean, one third of the Earth's CO2 equivalent emissions come from agriculture, right? And if we're going to have any go at, at changing this, especially over the next 30 years, as the population grows by 2 billion and we have to continue growing food for the extra, extra people, we really need to look at better ways to manage um, CO2 emissions. Now, a uh, majority of that, one third of CO2 emissions come from uh, the lost soil carbon, like Soil. Um, I mean, think about it, and in, in, think about soil carbon in a, the context everyone knows about, which is coal, right? Like, um, so we take coal out of the ground, we burn it. We're not putting coal or any equivalent soil carbon back into the ground right now at any significant rate to to mitigate that. Um, but the, uh, there is an opportunity there, and we can. We know across agriculture, we know uh, there are a lot of farmers. We've spoken about the regenerative ag side of things. Um, really trying to put soil carbon back into it. And it's a win-win game, right? It's win for the farmer. There's more soil moisture, big issue we have up here in Australia. Um, there's more, uh, the soil has more ability to hold nutrients if it has more carbon in it. And we also, you know, do, do a better job in terms of managing CO2 emissions. The biggest challenge here, this is where we come into it, is that we just don't, um, we don't, our farmers don't have tools to understand how much CO2 is or how much carbon is in the soil to start with. Uh, and it's or it's really hard to to pull that out and to actually analyze because it's not like soil it's not like co2 in the atmosphere you can't just pull out a measuring device and go deep there's you know it doesn't move around much in soil it's really scientifically complicated all that sort of stuff and so what we're trying to do at farm Lab is we've realized this we've gone well you know we love data and we love software um, you know, but you know what we really need to give to farmers is kind of like a bank account for their soil. So if anyone knows like um, zero for small businesses, uh, you know it's a great reporting tool. It helps you track and manage all your uh, all your finances. That's what we do for soil soil information, not just carbon, but um, anything that that we get tested in the soil. And so we're providing that, I guess you know, soil management kind of like kind of like a financial platform for for the environment so that farmers can come, they can look at their changes over time and they can start to start to better manage that. Um, uh, we've, we've had some great results already where, you know, really, really pushing hard on the carbon space and we've probably got about a dozen soil carbon projects under our belt. Our goal over the next five years, Lou, is to, um, you know, sequester five million tonnes of carbon, um, you know, with the help of software and, uh, and partnerships with growers as well. And we think that by doing that, we can, we can make a big impact on, uh, on CO2 emissions globally. And one of the things we might come back and just quickly talk at the end, Victor, is like, what does it mean to actually grow these solutions, you know, in proximity to the challenge where we're actually on country, you know, in country, that's really critical. But just before we move to q and I just, we've got two fantastic researchers who work with industry. Could you just give us a sense, Tamsin and Pete, about what are the things that you're working on that are really outside the box at the moment? What are you seeing industry puzzle about that is actually pulling you in to help? Um, Tamsin, do you want to go first on that? Yeah, so um, some of you may have seen our virtual chicken and I just want to mention that. I think um, apart from being really cool and all, like many of the panellists, I'm a bit of a tech head. So the opportunity to do virtual reality and put it out there um, was one I just couldn't pass up. Um, and really, 
you know, yes, it's educational, but it's also about engagement. And I think, you know, the poultry industry for many reasons has a bad rap, but when you dig under the surface, there's some really awesome things going on. And, and when we talk sustainability, you know, we're working with um, a group that are looking at recycling food, human food that is just chucked into waste for chickens. And that's a pretty cool project. Um, and then on side that, we've got some awesome circular economy projects. So taking the waste from chicken, turning it into energy to then run the sheds. And so, you know, the industry is not talking about being carbon neutral anymore. It's about, you know, actually generating more power than what they actually need to use. So it's a really cool project. And I think, you know, once people hear about this, they're going to want to be more involved in agriculture. And I think one of the, the things that I think hasn't come out today is that, yeah, there's some really awesome panellists and, and people that understand how cool farming is. But for the most of the country that lives in the cities, they've got no idea and they don't, they don't realise the opportunity that they could play in generating awesome food for the whole country. Yeah. And I think the pandemic itself has probably highlighted that we need to be more focused on that. And when we look at one of the biggest issues in agriculture, it's attracting people. You know, the average age of a farmer is in their late 50s. What are we doing wrong? And so the more that we can get this message out about what innovations are happening, I think the more we're going to attract younger people to want to be part of this awesome industry. Yeah, this is a movement, isn't it, that we, that I know you've been just making such an extraordinary difference. Um, and I've seen the evidence of that in Tamworth, particularly seeing young people actually wanting to come and be part of what you're working on. And Pete, yeah, what's what's happening outside the box in meat science? That, um, yeah, thanks, Lou. Well, realistically, we know a lot about what things in meat affect its, its quality, but a lot of those things are not visible. You know, we can't see them. So in our modelling of of meat quality, there's a lot there that if we could simply measure these traits, um, then we can get a much better estimate of, of that eating quality of that product. So there's always that tech development. But one that really excites me and it kind of loops back in with a lot of other people is we do a lot of expensive, very expensive consumer testing um, where we, you know, feed meat and, and ask consumers what they think. But everyone these days is asking for more information about their food. So I, I'm trying to generate this project where, well, this program where it's a two-way street. We'll tell you what it is, but you have to tell us how you cooked it and what you thought of it. And that, and that consumer data, yes, it'll be noisy, but if we get enough of it, it's going to be so valuable. And therefore, we can do research, like consumer-based research, uh, using, the, using the population all the way around the world of people that eat our meat without, without leaving our office. So it's things like that, that connectivity mm -hmm. and, the, and the systems we can build these days to be able to answer some of those questions that, um, yeah, it was really, really fun. And, and uh, you know, we couldn't do that 10 years ago, but we certainly can now. Now, I just have to tell you, I did see Pete actually got five out of five from his students in terms of ranking that. Nobody gets that kind of score. And it's because he engages people in, you know, um, that real curiosity around how could we do this together? So, um, Pete, thank you for that. Yeah. Victor, I'm going to throw back to you because I know you've got some questions burning. Um, and do you want to, shall I hand back and I'll mute? Yeah, look, what we'll, we'll might do, Lou, uh, and we're, we're so inspired. We've got so many questions. Oftentimes in these things, we'll bring people onto the panel. But I think we might do that after nine o'clock. I think if I throw the questions um, out there. Look, there have been about five or six questions about money. And, and the best one is from my friend, Simon Spencer, who actually works for one of the banks and says, look, how can banks and insurance companies better support and promote the inspiring and vital work that the people on the panel are leading. Do you want to lead uh, away with that, Lou, and then, then work that through? So, so how, how, if you're working for a bank or an insurance company and you're watching this, how can you make a contribution? Uh, I've, got an, I've got an answer to that, if I can jump in, Lou, because we are talking to two banks exact, and insurance companies about this exactly uh, exact thing right now. So, so yeah, the biggest impact they can have um, uh, is valuing something we call natural capital, right? The natural capital looks at the full, I guess, environmental risk across, um, uh, just for your email pop up, Simon, so of course you use it in more detail, but it, natural capital looks at the environmental risk 
uh, across the, the farm business. Um, and by better valuing natural capital, it becomes almost another, another line on the balance sheet. So you've got your, you know, you've got your revenue, um, your costs, and then your natural value, uh, natural capital. Um, it's really important. We're doing a lot of work right now talking to a few of the major banks here in Australia and globally about um, giving them the soil information to better assess that because the soil is kind of that starting point and it's also a bit of a bit of a bit um, an indicator around, sort of a lead indicator around natural capital. So what you can do with your money um, as far as a banking or, a banking or financial institution goes is, is convince your um, uh, you convince your insurance company if you're a bank, um, or work with your clients to help them assess the natural capital and then provide loans, lower risk loans, uh, lower insurance premiums based on good environmental stewardship and the improvement of natural capital. That's that's general. Um, we have some other things that we're doing around the generation of carbon credits that um, banks and insurers. Uh, can also get involved in that also benefits the grower by um, allowing them a mechanism to generate more revenue across the farm by uh, producing carbon credits by better sequestering soil uh, soil carbon and then um, selling those credits on the uh, carbon credit market which is it's being established at the moment so um, absolutely. I think it's absolutely brilliant. Now, Sophie Krantz has sent in a question which is a, a really interesting question uh, Peter Diamandis says the easiest way to become a billionaire is to solve the problems of a billion people. And I think each of you have talked about solving the problems of a billion people, but not everyone is driven to being a billionaire. Many people want to use business to solve societal, economic, or environmental problems around the world. What advice do the panelists have to people who want to make a difference at this time? How can innovation be leveraged? Sarah. I don't think that it's about making a million dollars. I don't think any startup founder actually thinking of a million dollars, they're thinking about making a change for the better and they're thinking about finding a way, they've, they've found a way to do something in a different way that will help whatever, people, animals, plant, oil, anything. So I, I really don't, if, if it's like becoming an overnight success if it took 15 years. Um, I, I don't think that's how our sort of people think it's all about we're thinking about how to solve the problem not how much money it's going to make us in the long term and and i'll go, go a bit further it's it's you think you a lot of us start out fixing our own issues we have our own problem our own passion and that's what we jump into and solving the problems of a billion people you're talking about that being their number one problem it started out as our number one problem honing in on how that affects what other people's pain is, is, is probably the hardest thing we did reflecting six months, 12 months ago and going, we've built this, but everyone has a problem over here. So it's, it's how do they, how do they marry? How do they um, nest into each other? And that's, that's the key, I think, to embedding innovation is to make it fit, make it market fit. Don't, um, don't just solve your own problem. You're really looking at what else that, that, that customer base of peak going out and finding out what that, that customer feedback is, is paramount to how do you, how do you find more people that have the same pain and want the same, same outcomes? Now my friend, Rob Gell, um, many of you would know from his old television days has asked a, a deep question. Many of us online here in Australia are in the Murray Darling basin. And, and Rob's question is really around given the, water problems and environmental problems that, that face us in the Murray Darling. You know, how, how will we find our way through these things? How will we solve those deep environmental problems that are inhibiting um, the growth of, of more food uh, and, and, you know, a better environment in, in that space? So I think, Lee, you had, you, you're obviously deep in there and Tamsin, you threw up your hand. So if you two want to take the lead first, and we might make this the last formal question, and then we'll have a sort of more informal questioning after nine o'clock. So, Lee and Tamsin? Yeah, so I might, I'll jump in. Um, I, I think sometimes we're trying to solve these massive problems and come up with these big innovations. And I think to everybody who's listening, every time you chuck out food, you've wasted the energy of so many farmers, whether it, you know, um, and, and animals. And I think the more we can actually start just little at home, looking at what we're doing and how we can live more sustainably 
I actually believe the next generation is going to solve these problems and call me optimistic. But I think the more that everybody does the right thing at home, children learn by what's going on around them and by, by creating a, you know, an environment where we're conscious of what we're doing and we're not you know, buying too much plastic and we don't buy the apples wrapped up in plastic already. We, we bring our own bags to put plastic in. There's really simple things that everybody that's listening today could do. And I believe when you do that, the effect it has on the people around you effect that it has it on the children that we will solve these problems and you know by the time i have grandkids i'll be going yes we, you know wow we've solved the Murray darling water issue because some cool kid whose family cared about this thought of a novel idea so yeah uh, i'll let tams tams and you know it, she's right on the money there with it, it's such a big conglomerate issue you look at the murray darling and the, the murray's healthy and has had huge water flows in the last 12 months in the middle of a record drought. So it, it's, it's uh, two different systems. You know, the Darling almost finishes by the time it gets to the Murray, it's done all its work it can do, all it, all it can lift. Um, there's been a real, I'm 100 Ks from, from water for me. So we, we don't have water in our system and can't have it in our business in irrigation. But there's been a real honing in on, you know, cotton and certain industries being a real, um, uh, driver of the end of this result and instead of looking at this is a national resource this is how do we use it the best waste it the least don't throw it out in the bin you know every time you throw that apple away you're throwing away a certain amount of water that's gone to actually generate it not just electricity so there's a, a footprint we're leaving behind so whatever that water generates for us as, as a fiber or a food it, it's how do we make it the most efficient in our system? And that's, you know, we, ha we, we keep looking at state borders and who uses more over which side of the, the divide instead of really going, right, how do we use it best at source and make sure that the, the river stays healthy? And that, that for me, until, you know, the, the Murray-Darling agreement we've got now, I think is the first iteration of how do we uh, socially and politically try and address this. And I think it's, it's this evolving, we've got to keep, if we think we're going to put that on the shelf and that's where it stays, that's not the optimist in me says, no, we're going to get that out. And we're going to go, right, let's rewrite that bit. Let's yes. rewrite that bit. And, and we've got to keep going with that to, um, to, to break it and fix it. Otherwise we're, we're going to get what we've got yesterday. But, but <laughs> I love that, you know, every child can't solve the problem of the Murray darling, but they can hold an apple and either eat it or throw it away. And, and my God, that, that is so practical. Listen, we're right up two minutes um, to the time we committed to letting people go. So Lynn and, and Robert, um, as, as the co-chairs, if, if you'd like to add, add your two bits, and then I'd like to ask Lou to finish off by thanking our panellists and attendees. Lynn? Well, thank you very much uh, for this really stimulating conversation, organising the attendees. Uh, Lou, all the optimistic uh, outback people with so many ideas. It's a pleasure to meet you all. Please look at your, uh, your ideas are on Idea Spies, most of them. Love any feedback that you have. Uh, Jack, you're in Canada. That's uh, where the idea from, for Idea Spies came about uh, on a trip where a guy said, promote what you love rather than bash what you hate. And that's what we're doing now. It's wonderful to hear your ideas. Thanks again for hosting, Victor. Pleasure. And remember, ideaspies.com. It, it's just a fantastic place to, to share your ideas. Rob Masters. I'll, I'll close, Victor, and just thank Lou and all the panellists and the contribution you have made. Uh, I noticed one of the questions was, how, how do we keep this going? Um, I think optimism is the key to everything in uh, being kept going. But uh, I like Lee's quote, to use it best and waste it least. I think we could take that message away along with Tamsin's the Apple um, analogy. So thank you very much for everyone and all the participants um, in this. I don't know how many participants we have, but thank you very much. And we've done a lot of these and, and um, April from Denver has just said, this is in fact the best we've ever done. Oh. Um, I, you know, I owe you so much, Lou, and each of you panelists. So Lou, if you'd like to thank the panellists and the attendees, and then after you've done that, we'll just let people, we've still got some questions that can be asked, uh, but if you could take it away, Lou. 
Oh, thank you, Victor. Thank you so much for having us. And I think it's that saying that, you know, if you want to go fast, go alone, but if you want to go far, go together. And I think that's what reminds us here that across this sort of inland innovation space, and we have, you know, friends and colleagues and knowledge partnerships across Australia that will really drive what we know is so critical that um, to build, you know, that nobody is left behind as we build good economy and good futures. So, Thank you so much. Thank you to the wonderful panellists. Uh, it's been lovely to be able to show um, the world from Denver to, uh, to elsewhere, you know, what's actually happening in Australia. So I guess I encourage you to connect in with us. You know, if you want to contact any one of us, please, I'm happy to make introductions. Um, but thank you, Lynn, Robert, Victor. I think you are an awesome, you know, group of wonderful people who have connected into our region. So we feel very grateful to you. Thank you. Well, we hope you've enjoyed this event um, co-hosted by the Centre for Optimism and Idea Spies. Um, if you'd like to get involved with the Centre for Optimism, go to our website. You can sign up for membership um, or you can uh, sign up for a free event subscription and get involved with Idea Spies at ideaspies.com. And then most of all, um, those wonderful entrepreneurs in inland Australia led by Lou Conway at the University of New England. And if you need any of those contacts, uh, you can contact me, Victor Purton, through the Centre for Optimism.